Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Isabel Delas, the Chief Executive Officer of Luxlag. I'm extremely pleased and enthusiastic to welcome you here today in person at our fifth edition of the Luxflag Sustainable Investment Week. Luxlag is very proud to say that since the first edition of the LSIW back in 2019, there has been great progress made by our associate members in terms of sustainable finance best practices. What will be shared over the next three consecutive afternoons of this LSIW23 is impressive considering the 22 standalone sessions covering a wide range of topics such as climate finance, ESG, impact investing in line with the sustainable development goals. This year, the LSIW has been certified a green business event for its environmentally friendly event organization by the General Directorate for Tourism of Luxembourg Ministry of the Economy. It is not a, just another gathering, it is an opportunity for us to finally come again together, connect, share ideas, have interesting discussions, and above all, shaping a more resilient world together. Indeed, today, the 17th of October marks also the United Nations designated International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, with this year's theme, Decent Work and Social Protection, Putting Dignity in Practice for All, which gives to our conference an even more significant meaning. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, in his message to honor that day, stated that nearly 700 million people are barely scrapping by living on less than $2.15 per day. Over a billion people are deprived of basic needs like food, water, healthcare, and education. Billions more lack sanitation or access to energy, jobs, housing, and social safety nets. Meanwhile, conflicts, the climate crisis, discrimination and exclusion, particularly against women and girls, are deepening the distress. Therefore, I do hope that this fifth edition of the LSIW will contribute to raise more awareness on the crucial role that the financial sector plays as a role to addressing the world's most pressing environmental and social challenges and in advancing towards a more sustainable and just transition. As we embark on today's journey, I would like to encourage also each of you to make the most of this time and to take advantage of the invaluable networking opportunities that lie ahead. We are here not only to learn and grow, but also to inspire and be inspired by the great individuals who have gathered here today from Luxembourg, Europe, and even beyond. Now, I would like also to say some words on behalf of Denise Voss, the chairwoman of the board of directors of Luxflag. Denise would have been uh, with us this week and today in particular to help open this fifth edition of the LSIW. However, she is not able to attend given some health issues. Be assured that she is on the road to recovery and sends her thanks to all of the speakers and participants for their precious support to Luxflag and the LSIW and for all you do to advance sustainability and sustainable finance. Thank you, Denise, for your support to us and engagement toward Luxflag and its sustainability community of associate members and partners. Before we start the sessions, I would like to inform you about a few housekeeping rules. Please make sure to keep your mobile phones on silent mode during the session in order not to create any disturbances. Please ensure also to give back your badges when you leave the LSIW. You can hand it over to one of our colleagues, the concierge, or put it in the fourth inbox uh, at the entrance. There will be also a coffee break from 4 to 4.30. And lastly, please be informed that there is a meeting room available upstairs upon request. So my colleagues, uh, Hélène and Viola, uh, Nairi and Hannah and Tony are all here around if you need some help to book that room for your meetings. As we start the fifth edition of the LSIW23, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Pierre Gramegna, Managing Director of the Open Stability Mechanism since 1st December 2022, 
Chief Executive Officer of the Open Facil Financial Stability Facility since the 13th of December 2022 and former Minister of Finance of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg and member of the ESM Board of Governors from December 2013 to January 2022. So, Pierre Gramenia's contributions to the Luxembourg financial sector, coupled with his commitment to sustainable finance, have left an indelible mark on our um, financial industry. We are really truly privileged to have him with us today, setting the tone for the three consecutive afternoons of engaging discussions and insights. Mr. Gramenia, the floor is yours. I thought, it's, I thought it's a bit strange to go behind the scenes when we're not in a theater. Thank you. Uh, dear friends uh, of, of Luxac, thank you very much, uh, Isabel, for your, for your kind words. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends uh, of Sustainable Finance, it's great to see you all. Uh, I have a special word uh, of... Uh, Gratitude to Denise Foss, who cannot be with us today, and who is your president and uh, delivers 100%, uh, even more, 110%, which economically makes no sense, but so let's say 100% uh, to Lux Flag. Um, this is one of the rare speeches I give in Luxembourg on, uh, for Luxembourg purposes, but basically what you are fighting for sustainable investment is not the Luxembourg issue, it's a world issue. And that's why I'm happy to be here. And uh, I've uh, committed a lot to sustainable finance over the past decades in the different jobs I had. And uh, I will be able to also tell you what the ESM, the European Stability Mechanism, can contribute to sustainable finance. So happy fifth uh, anniversary uh, of uh, the Luxflag Sustainable Investment Week. And I would like to start by saying that Luxflag has been a pioneer in uh, labeling investments uh, in the world. Uh, I think Luxembourg can be very proud of that. Um, I would say that in the same vein, in the same idea, Europe has been a pioneer uh, in uh, finger-pointing and uh, insisting on uh, the importance uh, of climate change. Now, being aware of climate change is one thing, the more difficult thing is how to deliver on the goals. And uh, the best way to deliver to the goals is that you make sure that every dollar, every euro, every currency that is spent takes into account climate change or more widely ESG, environment, social and governance issues. So basically, uh, you know, we have new acronyms uh, which are uh, filling our space and are difficult to remember. ESG is not even easy to pronounce, but I see a very simple word that can replace ESG. And I'm not suggesting we should replace it, but ESG stands for values. That's what you are fighting for. That's what we're all striving to achieve. So I'm going to try to put the whole issue of ESG in context. I will dwell most on climate change. Bear with me. Uh, I think it is probably the, the biggest part, part of the problem. But see in what I will say on climate change, the larger issue of uh, social and, and governance, and I will come back a little bit uh, to it. So I will dwell first on, on climate change, then I will insist on the leading role that Europe is playing in this area. And third part, I will focus a little bit on what an institution like the European Stability Mechanism can do and is doing. 
there's many ways of uh, describing the issue of climate change. One that I like a lot is a very simple one, which is a bit strange, but that you all know, and that is to say there is no planet B. Uh, just meaning that when we have uh, used and overused our resources, our natural resources on the planet, we will all be stuck. There will be no way of turning back and there will be no way of having uh, more natural resources. And uh, so once one accepts this very simple um, statement, there is no planet B, uh, one starts to have another look at all of it. And it's a, a rather new thing to, to, to tell the truth. It is rather new because until 30 years ago, we all had the impression that natural resources were plenty and uh, that nothing could happen in that area. If I look at the last developments in the Amazon, which is the largest green area uh, and oxygen providing area in the world, how quickly it's being deforested, even though recently with the new president, they're slowing it down a little bit, uh, you become really, really scared. Now, um, we have now a, a kind of a framework which is a reliable one, which is fortunately also organized by the United Nations, uh, that measures all the things, uh, and uh, the, the latest news is not a good one. Let's face the fact that because it's the United Nations that does the observation and does it, is already an achievement because it means that it's all the countries in the world have realized that we need to have a, a kind of organization that covers the whole globe that's doing it. And um, the World Meteorological Organization together with the United Nations is measuring the climate change and uh, disasters, natural disasters, have increased in, in an unbelievable way over the past decades. The cost since 1970 to 2021 of all these natural disasters is 4.3 trillion. That's a lot of money. But I think that this is still underestimated. Um, the United Nations thinks that in its emissions gap report of last year, that uh, uh, for the time being, and I think that's the, the saddest message I will have today, it's not my message, it's a kind of objective message, and the United Nations emissions gaps highlights that there is currently no credible pathway in place to reach the 1.5 target derived from the pa Paris Agreement. It's written. So, no need to, to have illusions or dreams that's what the specialists tell us. And I remember five or 10 years ago when the same specialists were telling us we're going to have more thunderstorms, uh, more uh, natural disasters, more floodings. Quite a lot of people were skeptical. But now, I mean, the last two or three years, what we have seen is just proving them right. Under the current circumstances, so that means if countries, all countries, do not do additional efforts, the same uh, UN specialists are claiming and estimating that we might have an increase of temperature of three degrees at the end of this century. And I remind us that the goal of the Paris Agreement is to have 1.5 degrees increase during this century as a goal. And so what is key is that first, we make sure that there are fewer climate skeptics around. That's one of the missions, I think, of Lux Flag, is just to spread the news, give the facts, the data, because there's still lots of climate skeptics around. And if you watch what's happening everywhere in the world, also in Europe, there's a kind of pushback a little bit 
on environmental issues. Uh, maybe for some reasons that I can intuitively also understand, but that I do not accept or share, and I think which need to be put uh, into perspective, and I will come back to that. So one is make sure that we have as few climate skeptics as possible around everywhere in the world, have a common acknowledgement that would be the very first goal that we need to have. The second one, as I just mentioned, there is no credible path for the time being to get to the Paris Agreement um, goals. Number three, there's a few international institutions, a few countries, maybe even more countries now, that are investing a lot uh, in projects that uh, are uh, fit for climate. Two things here. What public institutions can do and what multilateral development banks can do is in the size of billions of euros or billions of dollars. Now you might say this is a lot of money, but what we need is trillions. And as the former Secretary General of the OECD always said, uh, Guria, Guria said always, we need to get from the billions to the trillions. And the only way to do that is to crowd in the private sector. So what we do, what Luxflag does, what the different countries do is good. What the multilateral development banks do is even better. What, for example, the European Investment Bank is doing is phenomenal. I mean, it's the institution in the world that does the most, in my opinion. You can quote me, some might disagree, but I think the EIB is doing a phenomenal job by basically soon uh, achieving 50% of loans and projects that are green or ESG. No other institution has achieved that. But still, we're talking billions. And where the AIB is also very good is in crowding in private sector. So the number and the achievements of the AIB on this topic is not only about how much money they commit themselves, is how much money they can gather in the private sector with the banks, with the investment funds, uh, in order to finance more projects. This is, I have to say, uh, not something that we as ESM can do. I'm going to come back to the ESM later because we are not doing technical uh, assistance. We are not financing projects. I'm going to tell you what we do. But um, the EIB, be proud, those who sit here in the room, that the EIB has its headquarters here and is delivering on its mandate quite well uh, and ahead of others of how to, to combat climate change. Before uh, getting into two major points of, of my presentation, which is the leading role of Europe on the one hand and what the ESM is doing, let me also congratulate Luxflag, which exists since 2006 and has been a pioneer in this area. Congratulations to you, Isabel, for uh, taking up the challenge and for your enthusiasm and your team for putting together this event, but just to keep on uh, the strategy and the fight for climate change. So, in two parts, the leading role of Europe. So, uh, the Paris Agreement, I mentioned it, has set the goal to be climate neutral compared to the 1990 emissions uh, and limiting the increase of uh, the temperature by on 1.5 degrees by 2050, that's the goal. The European Union has committed to achieve a reduction of 55% of this goal already by 2030. Very ambitious. Uh, and uh, in fact, I think we're the only area in the world that has committed to do even more uh, in the beginning, front-loading a lot of the effort uh, instead of uh, postponing it. There's many ways you can do that. You can do that the IB has financial means, but there's one area we, where Europe has been particularly good that is in setting the 
uh, regulatory framework for this. And the Commission had this great idea to, to call this the taxonomy. I don't know where they found that name. Well, I was told it's a Greek name, but to have the word tax in it is really disturbing. But it was too late when, when they started to use the word. Now everybody talks about the taxonomy and so be it. But the effort was worthwhile and, and, and is recognized. And so by 2021, the EU gave itself a framework of uh, what is green and what is not. And particularly in finance, what is green and what is not. Sounds easy, but this is extremely complicated. Uh, I would also dare say that we haven't seen uh, the last evolution of what is green and what is not uh, as it is now. Obviously, these notions evolve. Apart from setting what's green and what is not, what is even more important, or at least as important, is the disclosure. The policy where you communicate what you do and what your standards are. I prefer institutions and countries and people who say we are not there yet, but we are somewhere and the somewhere where we are on the leather is here. And we commit ourselves to disclose year after year how much progress or how, how little progress we have done. This helps a lot in terms of transparency and credibility. And believe me, now that I am still, as before, as finance minister in Luxembourg, dealing with financial stability, what markets, what observers, what journalists are looking for is credible action and credible data and credible communication. If you try to disguise things in these areas, you will be in the end uh, losing out in terms of image and in terms of credibility. Um, let's stay a moment with uh, climate change. I have looked into it a lot, I've worked a lot on it over the last years, and I think we have a tricky triangle uh, with uh, climate change uh, and ESG, but particularly with climate change. Let me explain the tricky triangle. Number one of the three sides of the triangle is make sure we have rules that are credible, so the taxonomy of Europe is what's best for the time being out there on the planet, and we must avoid greenwashing. So that's a risk. If your set of rules is such that it, it is not really covering the topic seriously, you have an issue. So avoid greenwashing. The other side of the triangle is what I would call social stranding. Um, what I mean by that is that Sometimes, if not often, it happens that some human activity, some economic activity is very profitable in terms of, of end year results, but adds a huge carbon footprint on the planet. Let me give one example, there are many. This year alone, 300 fossil fuel um, uh, equipments, industries, new projects are being built in China. 300, just in this year. So this is obviously worrying. On the one hand, so nothing to do with, with climate. And then when you close down similar industries, for example, in Europe, you have social issues, people losing their job because you close a coal plant. How to deal with this? And this is not abstract examples. We've seen quite a few examples of shutdowns of industrial equipment, industrial industries in Europe because of compliance with CO2 
emission reductions, and people saying, now wait a minute, we close down a, an industry here, and then at the other end of the world, 300 new plants are being built. Social stranding. Also, we see this with cars all over Europe. There are subsidies to buy electric cars because they're more expensive. And obviously, uh, the less wealthy people cannot buy a car, so you need state subsidies for it. It's probably the right solution. But just to say we have social issues in the triangle. And then we have the third issue, which is the issue of stranded assets. I think for us at ESM, this is something that is very close to our mandate, ensure financial stability. If you invest today in a coal plant in Europe, let's stay with Europe, and you might make large profits in the next three years because there's a, a gap uh, in, in energy supply, but then maybe in three years from now, not only the public, but the rating agencies, the markets are going to say, now wait a minute, this coal plant cannot go on for the next 20 years. You need to close down this coal plant. Well, then your asset is not any more worth what you thought it is. It's not any more worth what the stock exchange was anticipating. So I want to say, to underline that all these three things are important, are interacting with each other, what nobody knows in this example of the coal plant is when is the tilting point where markets are going to say in Europe or eventually in the United States, no, a coal plant like this in terms of preserving our planet is not bearable, is not acceptable anymore. If you have invested three years ago a hundred in this and it was a project that was supposed to have a return on investment on 20 years, and after three or five years you're being told you cannot continue, you imagine what an impact this has on your assets. So whenever you think of climate change issues uh, and uh, investment in this area, think of the tricky triangle, avoid greenwashing, issues of social stranding, and the issue of stranded assets. So with my example on coal plants, I have already hinted at the fact that it's not enough that Europe is super efficient in reducing its emission. I haven't looked it up recently, but I think the emissions of Europe are 10% of the world. So how do, make, do we make sure that the other 90% uh, try to deliver? So the World Meteorological uh, Association organization has estimated recently that the probability of exceeding 1.5 degrees threshold of the Paris Agreement between now and 2027, that's in four years, this risk today is 66%. In 2015, that's not long ago, that's eight years ago, this risk was estimated to be zero. So in eight years, we have gone from a risk that was zero to a risk that is two-thirds. I, I repeat what the assumption is, to have in those next four years, one year where we have an uh, uh, um, increase of temperature of 1.5% uh, occurring. So not uh, very uh, reassuring. And what adds to the difficulty is the period in which we live. When the Paris Agreement was signed in 2015, we had had no pandemic, we had had no Ukrainian war, we hadn't had the recent geopolitical conflicts that are happening all over the world. So we are in a period that's much more uncertain and which risk to push climate issues uh, into not oblivion, but make them secondary priorities. You will see this more and more. 
you see this pushback on climate for many reasons. One of the reasons is the social issue I just mentioned. The other one is let's focus now on geopolitical conflict. You could say these are just excuses. I'm not saying this is good. I'm just saying this is happening. So uh, having been myself present at the Kyoto conference back in 1997, where I was the spokesperson on behalf of the European Union, because Luxembourg had the presidency of the European Union at the time, and having attended the Bonn conference, the Paris conference, the Madrid conference over the years, <clears throat> I have the impression that we're losing momentum just because of geopolitics. So we need to be aware of it, not just close our eyes, it will pass, and then we go on. It's not business as usual. So I, I think we need to work harder to explain that we need to keep this solidarity that we have developed uh, in the uh, Paris Agreement. This being said, what can an institution like the European Stability Mechanism do? Let me first explain to you uh, how uh, we function. The European Stability Mechanism and the, the EFSF, which was its predecessor for two years on a transitory basis, <clears throat> was born in, in 2010 for the EFSF and 2012 for the European Stability Mechanism to cope with the financial crisis that hit the whole world and Europe in 2010. And uh, there was a kind of hole, a kind of uh, missing piece in the European architecture for the monetary union. I can explain this in more simple terms. Countries around the world, there is 190 that are a member of the International Monetary Fund, when they have major issues in their trade balance, major issues to get finance on the markets, and nobody else can help them anymore. They go to the IMF, and the IMF helps them with programs that countries need to undergo, and on the other side, they get financial support, loans, which they have to pay back. And when we had these problems in Europe with the common currency, the euro, and the euro area, there was a couple of issues. First, the amounts that were needed were very high, which the IMF would have eventually have problems to mobilize. And second, we thought we need to have a solidarity amongst ourselves. We have a common currency, we have a common destiny, we have the European Union. We want to grow together, we have a single market. So before we go to the IMF to help us, we need to help ourselves. So that's why, the uh, member countries uh, of the euro then were 17 countries, today there are 20 uh, that have the euro. They decided to have a capital that would ensure the stability of the euro area. And the paid in capital is 80, slightly over 80 billion euros, eight zero. Now you might say this is a lot or this is not enough. It's just important to realize that it is the highest paid in capital of any international financial institution. So more than the IMF, more than the EIB, multilateral development, more than any other institution. And why was that? Because the countries wanted to show that they are committed to the common currency. They, they wanted to preserve the euro area, whatever it takes. Remember the formula of Mario Draghi back in 2012. And the whatever it takes was on not only words and the central bank with the monetary policy, it was the creation of the ESM with 80 billion paid in capital, which means we also have a callable capital. So if the 80 billion are not enough, we can call up to 600 billion euro to the member states of the euro. Obviously, I can tell you that calms down the markets immediately. So that's why DSM was created. And then, when we help countries, we are not distributing our capital. The capital that we have, we invest it in safe assets. And with this 80 billion of guarantees, 
we ensure a AAA rating. And with this AAA rating, we lend money on the markets at a very low rate. And we pass that low rate to the beneficiary countries, the five countries that we have helped, Greece, Portugal, Spain, Cyprus, and Ireland. So these countries benefit from the low interest rates that the ESM gets. And so we have a portfolio of 300 billion euro that we manage and finance and refinance. So that's how we function. I, I took a little bit of time to explain that because we are completely different from a European investment bank. We are different from an African development bank or other multilateral banks that do projects. We do not fi finance projects. We cannot choose to finance a green project versus another one because that's not what we do. We're purely financial institutions. So how can such an institution play a role in ESG? It's not an easy question, but over the last years, we have been very active in that, so even before I joined. And so the uh, ESM joined the central bank and supervisors for greening the financial system initiative as an observer. And uh, that helps us a lot uh, see how peers, our peers do. And all of these institutions have financial stability as their goal. But our ambition was also to see what we more directly can do in terms of ESG, uh, ESG, not only climate, ourselves. So we have started to publish a summary report of all the things that we do uh, in the ESM, which we published this month uh, of July, which you can find uh, on uh, our website. We publish our own uh, carbon footprint, uh, for invest, uh, for, for example, uh, and the likes. But we have gone a step farther uh, rather recently in seeing how we can grade uh, the 300 billion, uh, the 300 billion that uh, we have in our portfolio, which we finance and refinance for the five beneficiary countries. And as I explained before, this is purely financial. How can we grade that? And so uh, we decided um, that we need a special methodology for that. So we look at the countries uh, in which, uh, which buy our bonds, how those countries do, and we have used a, a methodology uh, from uh, an, an outside uh, provider uh, to see how uh, these countries are doing. And this ESG scoring that we're doing uh, came out at an average of 73 out of 100, which means that uh, we are in the advanced category in, in this area. So I think this is a very original way of measuring it. And then uh, last but certainly not least, our own capital, the 80 billion, we have now a policy that tries, when possible, to have a preference for ESG investments of our pay, uh, paid in capital. Uh, and we are implementing that and we are also publishing results on that. In conclusion, I would like you to maybe think of three takeaways of what I said. First, a bigger picture, which is the following. Climate change issues are there to stay. They're not going away. We will have a bumpy road over the next decades to combat uh, the uh, climate change issues. And we must not be distracted on the road to the Paris Agreement, but by many bumps on the road. For me, the one that's obvious today is uh, the uh, geopolitical conflicts that will certainly slow down and also take out some uh, financial uh, room of maneuver uh, away from climate to other issues. 
defense being obviously defense expenditure being a, an important one. Uh, but I think t there's it's difficult to do a trade-off between climate change and defense. Um, but uh, that's a challenge for politicians. So geopolitical conflicts have phases where they go up and then phases where they go down. That's how, how it goes. But climate change, it's not coming and going. It's there to stay. So we must keep that in mind and governments uh, need to keep that in mind and need to act now. As I said before, Europe is ahead of the pack. There's more countries being motivated. Let's not forget that a country like China has committed to the Paris goals for 2060 instead of 2050, but they have committed to the goal. So we are not alone out there. My second point is it's not enough to have public funding for climate change projects. We need to crowd in the private sector. And third point, climate change is by essence something that we need to tackle at the level of the planet. So it means international organizations play a critical role. And don't underestimate this, this is key. And we Europeans, because we have the European Union, because we try to shape our destiny together, we are very much used to international organizations. We find that a natural thing. But this is not the case in other areas of the world. That's why it is welcome that the United Nations and the Paris Agreement and all this is done at United Nations level. But then again, let's be pleased, maybe eventually proud, that uh, our international organizations, be it the EU itself, the European Investment Bank, the ESM, and others are pioneers in this area, as LuxFlag is. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pierre Gramenia, for this uh, very insightful speech. I think we uh, uh, have a lot of uh, challenges to face in front of us, uh, and all together we, we can achieve some of them, at least focus on, uh, we have the key takeaways is to focus on, on climate change challenges, for sure. Uh, before we start our program, I would like to uh, express also uh, my gratitude on behalf of LuxLag, of course, to our partners, guest speakers, sponsors, charter members. We have the chance to have ABBL, ACA, ADA, ALFI, VIB, Luxembourg for Finance, Luxembourg Stock Exchange, and the government of Luxembourg uh, as a charter member for LuxLag since uh, its creation. Of course, to thank also our media partner, a volunteer from the University of Luxembourg, yesterday to help us as well and also to the amazing LuxFlag team with whom I have the chance to uh, collaborate uh, every day. Uh, your dedication and support are key to the success of uh, this event and to the work that we do. Thanks as well to all of you, our loyal attendees, uh, for being part of the LSIW uh, journey.